Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Hey there, Mom and Daughter Fighting listeners. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know about a story coming up a little later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. In its work for the nonprofit APIA Scholars, Macy's is committed to making a difference in the lives of Asian and Pacific Islander students across the country. From May 1st to the 31st, you can support APIA Scholars by rounding up your Macy's in-store purchase or donating online. These funds will equip Asian and Pacific Islander American students with the tools and resources they need to prepare for academic, personal, and professional success. Stick around to hear from Noor, an APIA scholar. Welcome to Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Thursday, May 4th. Today, we have a special episode for you. It's a collaboration I did with Slate's The Waves podcast. I sat down with Virginia Soulsmith, author of the new book, Fat Talk, Parenting in the Age of Diet Culture. It was a really interesting discussion, and I can't wait for y'all to hear it. If you're a Slate Plus member, be sure to stick around because Virginia and I dole out some advice at the end of the episode. So without further ado, here's the show. Welcome to The Waves, Slate's podcast about gender, feminism, and important conversations. Every episode, you get a new pair of feminists to talk about the thing we can't get off our minds. And today, you've got me, Jamila Lemieux, a writer and co-host of Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast. Later in the show, I'll be joined by author Virginia Soul Smith. Today, we're going to be having a very important conversation about a very important topic, diet culture. As an elder millennial, I grew up in an era where thin was not just in, it was everything. Heroin chic, Slim Fast Shakes, Callista Flockhart on Ally McBeal, Snackwell's Cookies, Fat Monica on Friends, tabloids that moralized over celebrity weight gain and fawned over celebrity weight loss. Nearly everyone on TV was thin, and if they weren't, they were probably the butt of a joke. You got a shot of Monica. Where's Monica? Over here, Dad. Wait, how do you zoom out? There she is. Some girl ate Monica. Shut up. The camera adds 10 pounds. Uh, So how many cameras are actually on you? Diet culture ruled my childhood, and the result for me has been a lifetime of disordered eating. There's been drastic change in the media landscape in recent years. Activists and influencers have demanded greater representation for fat bodies, and we've seen much more diversity in terms of the body types featured in TV, film, and advertising campaigns. A fat Black woman, Lizzo, rose to the top of the pop charts and has emerged as one of the most important recording artists of the era, something inconceivable when CNC Music Factory hired a model to lip sync to Martha Wash's vocals in the early 1990s. Watch had hits like Everybody Dance Now and was erased from public knowledge as thin women fake sang her songs on TV. Writers like Deshaun Harrison and Sabrina Strings have published important work about anti-fat bias in all areas of life, including healthcare, where it can be deadly. In some ways, it feels like things are changing, but there is still a long way to go in terms of fat acceptance in our society. On a personal level, I'm balancing my own disordered eating and body image issues while attempting to raise a child with a healthier relationship to herself, her size, and food than I've had. I was intrigued when I was first introduced to the work of today's guests. Virginia Soul Smith is a widely published journalist that interrogates diet culture and the hatred of fat and fat people that dominates our culture. Her new book, Fat Talk, Parenting in the Age of Diet Culture, helps parents navigate their own body issues while empowering their children to do battle with the fat phobia and fat shaming that is so pervasive in our culture, including among the doctors whom we look to for care. Fat Talk is paradigm shifting. It will challenge so much of what you think you know about weight and health and force you to reckon with the fat shamer within. We're going to take a quick break and Virginia will join us when we come back.
This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Anavani. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. And when you're a young adult, so much important change begins with access to higher education and resources. And that's why Macy supports APIA Scholars. It's a nonprofit devoted to the academic, personal, and professional success of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. And it's on a mission to support young adults like Noor. My name is Noor Ali, and I am an APIA scholar. The way that I grew up, I was a low-income first-generation college student. APIA scholars played such a big part of my undergraduate career. The scholarship actually, like, gave a really good boost to my savings and just maybe not worried about any unexpected costs like my laptop breaking or me needing a new textbook. I've been able to get a mentor through the API Scholarship Mentorship Program who has been guiding me through graduate applications. My goal is to pursue a doctorate in clinical psychology with a focus on like mental health for Asian Americans and other underserved communities. When you run up your Macy's purchase, you're not just supporting APIA scholars, but you're supporting the Asian American community. Now's the time to support APIA scholars like Noor. This May, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund access to leadership development programs, mental health support, and peer mentorships through APIA scholars. Give back and learn more at macy's.com slash purpose. Just recently, I learned that my mother, who is an artist, she was a teacher, she is a grant writer, I just learned that she almost became a nurse when she was much younger. I had no idea. The way I learned this is because last year for Mother's Day, I got her a subscription to StoryWorth. Make Mother's Day extra special for your mom or mother figure this year. Give her a unique, heartfelt gift that'll truly make her feel special and loved. The gift of StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories and stories for years to come. My mom's book is in the process of being bound right now. I'm so excited to see it. It's just such a great gift. I can't recommend it enough. I also got it from my dad for Father's Day last year. Give all the moms in your life a unique, heartfelt gift you'll cherish for years. StoryWorth. Right now, for a limited time, you'll save $10 on your first purchase when you go to storyworth.com slash mom and dad. That's S-T-O-R-Y-W-O-R-T-H dot com slash mom and dad to save $10 on your first purchase. Storyworth.com slash mom and dad. Hey, Waves listeners. If you're loving the show and want to hear more, subscribe to our feed. New episodes come out every Thursday morning. While you're there, check out other episodes too, like last week's about finding friends in middle age. Also, make sure you check out my show, Mom and Dad Are Fighting. We also come out every Thursday and Monday, and lately we've been talking about dealing with picky eaters and feeling touched out. We're back, and I'm now joined by Virginia Soul Smith. Virginia, welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be here. It's so good to talk to you again. Um, I interviewed you once for Mom and Dad Are Fighting a while ago, and it was such an illuminating conversation. I've been following your Burnt Toast newsletter since then, and I am consistently heartened and inspired by your commitment to challenging diet culture. I've learned so much from you. Thank you. I know. I really appreciate that. I'm here to help you love Flaming Hot Cheetos in a, <laughs> in a non-stressful I'm way. <laughs> I'm trying. I know. <laughs> So for those who are unfamiliar with your work, what is diet culture and how does it impact our lives? Diet culture is really the soup we're all swimming in. It's all of the messages you get and that you have gotten since you were a tiny, tiny child that your body can't really be trusted, that you can't really trust yourself to know how hungry you are, how full you are, how much you want to eat something just because it tastes good. Um, that something about your body is always should always be manipulated and that your appetite should be controlled. And all of this is in service of thinness, that a thin body is the ideal body we should all be striving for. And so we get diet culture messaging from all the obvious places, from media, social media, for sure. But it's also in public health messaging. It's in our kids' school health class curriculums. It's in the doctor's office, and it's even at the family dinner table, you know, in within our homes. We create a kind of diet culture. 
How did you break up with diet culture? What was the process of getting to a point where you would dedicate your career to addressing anti-fatness? The full disclosure story is I was not just someone who is consuming diet culture the way we all do. I was a diet culture creator for the first decade of my career. I wrote mostly for women's magazines and teen magazines, and I wrote health, nutrition, and fitness, all of which was diet culture. You know, it was portion control. It was never the really dramatic, like, grocery store tabloid headlines of, like, you know, lose 20 pounds in a week or whatever. But it was definitely that it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle plan. It's just making a few tweaks. It's, you know, these more subtle ways that we engage with diet culture was the kind of stuff I wrote for a long time. And I never felt great about it. I never felt like we were really helping anyone. I heard from readers all the time that they were still unhappy with their bodies. I was still unhappy with my body. Like, it was clearly not working. But I think so often... We sort of identify the harmful messaging, but we don't know what else there is, what else there can be. And so starting to want to explore those questions is what led me to the work I'm doing now. And in particular, becoming a parent, having my first daughter, who had a really complicated um, first few years of life health-wise and ended up with a pediatric feeding disorder and on a feeding tube for a few years. So we were suddenly in this whole other realm of our relationship with food as a family, it meant something very different to us. And I think being pushed outside that paradigm and having to sort of figure out a new way to make food safe for her helped me realize how much I wasn't allowing it to be safe for myself. And so that was a sort of an initial motivation. From there, I think I started with the relationship to food because that's where a lot of us start. It makes sense. We all have to eat multiple times a day. It can feel really hard. But as I got deeper into thinking about this, I realized anti-fat bias is what's underneath diet culture. All of those messages we get about how we're supposed to be eating and moving our bodies, how our kids should be eating and moving their bodies, how we as parents need to be responsible for raising kids who are, you know, quote, healthy eaters, all of that is in service of thinness. And so understanding how much the anti-fat bias underpins all of this is really where we need to be starting the conversation. So part of the reason that we're taught to believe that it's so important that we're not fat and that we keep our children from being fat is for our health. And in your new book, Fat Talk, you argue that the relationship between larger weights and poor health has been grossly overstated. Can you talk about that and some of the myths that we've come to believe about big bodies and health? Absolutely. I mean, the first thing I'll say is if you are really concerned about health, and in particular, if you are really concerned about children's health, then eating disorder prevention should actually be your starting point when you think about weight and health. Because we know that kids are at a much higher rate of risk of developing eating disorders than they are of developing type 2 diabetes. This is true for Every group of kids, every socioeconomic group, every race, like this is across the board. Eating disorders are the pandemic we aren't actually discussing. So that's the first piece of it. But then if we sort of step back big picture, because people will say, okay, but what about diabetes? What about heart health? All of that, these are all valid concerns, right? We have seen rates of these diseases increasing over the past decades. What we don't have, though, is clear evidence showing that high body weight is what causes these conditions. That is what the research has really been overstating, and the media coverage of the research has really been distorting in the last 40 years as we've been in this, quote, war on obesity. What is more likely happening is that the groups that have high disease rates may also tend to be in larger bodies, but that doesn't mean that the body size is what causes the condition. Those are just correlating factors. And so we really need to dig deeper into what's going on that we're seeing these diseases on the rise. And often it may just be that this is, you know, sort of like two coexisting facts about this group of people. There may be a third issue that's actually driving up body size and driving up disease, but it would be that root cause that you would want to get at that would actually improve health outcomes, not the weight itself. And so as we start to look deeper into social determinants of health, experiences of racism, experiences of chronic poverty, other forms of stigma, experiences of anti-fat bias as well, we see that all of this takes a really serious toll on people's health, 
on those biomarkers that contribute to the health outcomes that we're so worried about. And so all of that may be a much clearer explanation for what's going on than just what someone's point is on the body mass index. We're going to take a break here, but if you want to hear more from Virginia and myself, we're going to be answering a question from a listener who's concerned about her son's snacking habits in our Slate Plus segment. And please consider supporting the show by joining Slate Plus. Members get benefits like zero ads on any Slate podcast, no hitting the paywall on the Slate site, and bonus content of shows like this one. To learn more, go to slate.com backslash the waves plus. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you, fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hi, Spotify fans. We hope you're enjoying this rock in Guardians of the Galaxy playlist as much as these guys. I'm Star-Lord. I formed the Guardians. Oh, please. Be the first to see the final installment of Guardians of the Galaxy, written and directed by James Gunn. You left out some important information, but that is the gist of it. Don't miss your last chance to see them together. Mm -hmm. Now you're just making it sad. (laughs) Marvel Studios' Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in theaters Friday. Ready PG-13. May be inappropriate for children under 13. Tap the banner to get tickets now. This episode is brought to you by Certified Piedmontese Beef. Listen up, foodies. Make your next meal even better with real Nebraska beef. They have healthy, tender, delicious Italian heritage beef, grass-fed and sustainably raised on lush pastures in the Midwest. You can even create your own personally curated meat box that's shipped right to your door. To get two free steaks with any purchase over $50, use the code FREEBEEF at checkout. Learn more and shop exclusively at cpbeef.com. Welcome back to The Waves. We're talking to Virginia Soul Smith about her incredible new book, Fat Talk, Parenting in the Age of Diet Culture. Virginia, in the book, you talk a lot about the anti-fat bias that many healthcare professionals have and what a profound impact this has on the care we receive from young patients being ushered into eating disorders after conversations with their pediatricians about weight to large-bodied people being viewed as, quote-unquote, non-compliant and uncooperative. Can you talk about how that bias shows up in healthcare? Yeah, this bias is really... You know, as we think about weight and health, this bias, I really believe the research shows is at the root of all of it. Because when you walk into a doctor's office, there is automatically this power differential, right? Because of the way we view doctors in our culture. Of course, they have years of training, they have expertise, but they are also often disproportionately white, male, straight, you know, like every privilege you can think of tends to be this group of people. And so if you are walking into a doctor's office, With any marginalization, that's going to come into play. We know that there's medical racism, you know, medical misogyny, all of that is really true. And medical weight bias is also very real. It's very clearly documented in the literature that when fat folks come into doctor's offices, even if you're coming in with a sinus infection or a sprained ankle or something that really clearly doesn't have anything to do with your weight, very likely the first thing that's going to happen is you're put on a scale. And if your body weight is over a certain amount, doctors are going to start talking to you about weight loss before they will consider other treatments. And so we see this really harming the health of fat folks because they're often undertreated for the actual conditions they're struggling with. They're told they need to lose weight before they'll be a candidate for a certain surgery or before they can access fertility treatment. You know, there's all these different examples of how it plays out where weight loss has to happen first in order to access health care. 
But doctors are supposed to meet us where they are. They're supposed to meet patients in the bodies they're in. They're not supposed to be pushing this other agenda before they deal with what your actual health concerns are. And we also don't have safe and effective and sustainable ways for most people to lose weight. So doctors are often prescribing diets and exercise as the sort of, you know, like one size fits all prescription when we know that the failure rate of dieting is between 80 and 95%. I mean, you would never take a medication that your doctor said only had a 5 to 10% chance of working. You would want something that was going to actually treat your health problems. What do you think of recent guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics recommending diets for kids ages two and up and medication for teenagers to lose weight? I was really discouraged by this decision. And I think a lot of us who work in fat activism were, and also a lot of doctors. I mean, I've heard from a lot of pediatricians who really disagree with the guidance and are worried about what it's going to mean for how they want to practice medicine. I mean, we know that the top predictor for eating disorder risk for kids is childhood dieting and experiences of weight-based teasing or shame. And so if you are a kid in a bigger body and you go into a doctor's office and you are told that you need to lose weight, you're being put on a diet that's going to increase your risk for an eating disorder, and you're probably experiencing shame because of the stigma that we've just talked about. So right there, these guidelines are driving kids towards the type of health condition we should be actively working to prevent. We also know that there's no long-term research on the safety of weight loss medications for kids as young as 12. We don't have good data on what happens if you give a teenager bariatric surgery. Kids' bodies are growing and changing in so many ways during these years that to get in and mess with them in this way is really feels really dangerous to me. And I think it's really a violation of Again, what doctors are there to do, do no harm, and of the trust that they should be building. We want kids and families to feel like their doctors are on their team, that they can have, you know, a great rapport with them, that they can be heard, that their bodies are safe there. And that is just not what I see happening with these guidelines. A lot of parents see obesity prevention as one of their jobs as caregivers to children. Can you talk about why that's such an unhealthy approach to parenting and some of the issues that it can lead to, including eating disorders? Yeah, I think we're all given this pressure. I mean, especially moms, because women are socialized to usually be the feeders and caretakers of our kids' bodies in this way. Um, So we absolutely really do face a lot of very real judgment if we have a kid in a bigger body. You know, we it's framed as a parental failure. I see that all the time in the negative response to my work. Like, why aren't these parents just being more responsible? The reality is body size is largely genetic. About at least 60% of your body size is determined by your family history. So there's only so much parents can actually do to move the needle on this. And most of what they could do to make a kid smaller is going to be really harmful. It's going to be putting a kid on a restrictive diet that's going to make that child feel unsafe in their body, that's going to make them fixate on all the foods you're not allowing them to have, that's going to create a really distorted relationship with food and body, and just bring a whole bunch of stress and power struggle into your house that I frankly do not want at my dinner table. I do not want in my relationship with my kids. So the way I think about it is, what if we put weight to the side? What if we put nutrition to the side? And we thought about our goal with our kids and their bodies is body autonomy. We want kids who can trust themselves, who can you know, feel safe in their bodies, know that their body is worthy of respect and dignity at all times, and know that none of that value is contingent on being a specific size. And if you think about how making that your goal would just change the conversation so much, it would take so much stress out of these interactions, it really opens up the options of you know, talking to your kids about what foods they like and dislike and just keeping things very neutral, letting them say no to eating vegetables, even if you're like, oh, it's been several days and I don't know when you last ate a vegetable. I get it. Like, we, I have that stress too. But understanding that their ability to say no to you and to trust themselves and listen to their own bodies, that's actually a much more useful life skill than learning how to count calories and worrying about carbs when they're in the, you know, fourth or fifth grade. What other tips do you have for parents to create that environment where kids are trusting themselves and trusting their bodies? I mean, it's so hard because none of us show up to parenting with this figured out. You know, we all have our own stuff we're working through here. And look, the reality is it is easier to move through the world as a thin person. So I don't fault any parent who's thinking, I don't want my child to be bullied. You know, I don't want them to experience what I experienced around this. Like, 
I get it. That's, I think, where we're all starting. But we do have to think, like, in any other context, if your kid was being bullied for their clothes, you wouldn't go out and buy them whatever cool designer sweatshirt their friends were wearing. If your kid was being bullied for their gender identity, you wouldn't say, well, could you just be cisgender? Could you just be straight? You know, we wouldn't ask kids to conform to the bully's expectations. And when we think about weight is this thing that we're supposed to control, we're saying to kids, it's your body, it's your fault, you need to change to make everyone else around you more comfortable, which I think just really runs counter to a lot of our parenting values. So thinking much more in terms of how can I work with my kid to support them in their body? How can I help them understand that, yeah, this is a real issue. We are talking about systemic oppression, but I want to raise a kid who knows that it's not their body's fault, it's the system, and that we can actually be working to change the system. We can be naming anti-fat bias when we see it in TV shows and books and movies, all that kind of thing. We can be talking together about how to navigate diet culture and giving them the tools they need to do that instead of trying to make their body into this thing that the world wants from them, because that's just a losing proposition. Speaking of our own stuff, I do want to take a moment to talk about silencing those internalized voices. Virginia, I've tried so hard to commit myself to being fat positive, and I generally feel that I have a good relationship to fat bodies that are not my own. I see big bodies as beautiful and valuable, but I am terrified of occupying one again. I used to be what you would describe as a small fat. And I've been on the other side of that for a little bit more than a decade. You've been doing this work for many years now. How often do you hear your own internalized fat phobia creeping up on you? Do you feel like you're truly on the other side of diet culture? Or is this a constant negotiation that you're making? Such a good question. I do feel like I have made some major shifts for myself. In particular, writing this book really did help me you know, I'm sure there's still more on learning of bias I need to do. I think we're all forever a work in progress. But it did help me face up to some of the darker corners where I didn't even realize, oh, this bias still lives here. And I think for me, there has been quite a lot of relief in claiming the identity of small fat, which is the term we use to talk about folks who are in plus sizes, but on the lower end of that spectrum. And that's not because there's anything wrong with being on the higher end of the spectrum, but to recognize that the bigger you are, the more anti-fat bias you experience. So being able to claim my sort of place on the spectrum was actually really liberating because it helped me understand my body better and respect that this is where my body wants to be when I'm not fighting it, when I'm not dieting, when I'm eating and moving in ways that feel good. This is where I I live. And so, okay, this is what it's going to be. And I do think we can often, you know, do for our kids what we can't do for ourselves. So making a commitment not to talk negatively about my own body in front of my daughters turned out to be really cathartic for me because it meant I spent, oh God, several years realizing how often I wanted to say something negative about my body and catching myself and sort of reevaluating and looking at, well, what's what's going on underneath that? You know, what, oh, is it, is it really that I don't love my body today? Or is it that I'm stressed about work or social anxiety is kicked up or, you know, something else going on? And so doing that work. But I also want to be really clear that like, there's a lot of privilege in the ability to do this work. And for a lot of us, just loving your body at home in your living room is only going to get you so far because when you go out into the world, you are still experiencing you know, oppression and microaggressions and all of it on a daily basis, your body's not safe in all these other frameworks. So there is the need to do our own personal work. We deserve that. We, you know, we need support for that. But it's also fair to say, like, my personal work is really hard because the world keeps reinforcing that my body's not okay. And doing your own personal work doesn't help you access healthcare. It doesn't get fat people paid equal to thin people. You know, all of the ways the bias plays out in these tangible ways. So there's kind of two layers to this. And I think just understanding that you absolutely deserve that support for your personal struggle and your personal struggle may be made harder by the world, I think can be helpful. One of the things I love about your book is that it has language for talking to people about anti-fat bias and diet culture, your kids, your parents, medical professionals, teachers, and coaches. When we're engaging with folks, most of the people that we're dealing with are going to still be beholden to fat phobia and diet culture. 
what are some of the important things to think about as you attempt to tell people, hey, I'm doing something differently here. I'm not raising my child with those values. I'm raising them to think otherwise. Yeah, this is hard because, I mean, this is kind of what we were just talking about. You can do all the work in your own house and then you go out to the world and, you know, your child's track coach is talking to them about cutting carbs or something. And you're like, wait, wait, this is not what I want. I think there's often a knee-jerk response as people start to do this work where we think, I want to keep them in this like diet culture-free bubble. I don't want my child exposed to anti-fat bias. And like, that's not the world we live in. Our kids know that's not the world we live in. So we really have to shift our thinking to be thinking, how do I support my child in these situations? And how do we work together to navigate this? Because ultimately, our kids are going to have to be advocating for themselves. So it's something like sports that might look like if your child's considering a new sport, you know, maybe considering a new dance studio, new gymnastics studio, whatever it is, before you sign up saying to them, hey, I'm just curious, you know, what is what is your approach to eating disorder prevention in this sport? Because I know there are high rates of it in gymnastics and running, I mean, in pretty much every sport. Um, how do you think about that? What are you doing to make sure that the uniforms are size inclusive? Like how large is the size range that the uniforms come in? Because this is a big reason that fat kids don't participate in more activities if they literally can't wear the jersey or be included on the team in that way. So it's doing some due diligence for yourself, but also advocacy for your community in that sense can be really useful. And then it's about having a lot of conversations with your kid. Okay, you want to do this activity we know this is a sport with high rates of anti-fat bias where your body may not always feel safe. Let's have a plan in place. How are you going to let me know if the coach says something you're uncomfortable with? How, are you comfortable pushing back to the coach if there's commentary you you know that feels unhelpful to you? And really like working with your kid to think about this. It's not we're saying no, you can't play this, no, you can't dance, you know, none of that. But it is saying we're going to have some guardrails around this. And for sure if we're worried you, it's hard for you to eat enough to support your body, you know, with older kids, if we're worried about you losing your period in the sport, that is not acceptable. And we will step in to protect you at that point. So I, that, I think that's sort of big picture how I think about it is like, where can you push for a change? Probably it's going to be sort of small places, but you can be planting some seeds, getting other folks to be thinking about these issues. And then where can you be working with your kid to figure out, okay, what are you going to have to navigate? And what do you need to feel safe here? One of the groups in particular I found interesting when you talked about how to communicate with them, uh, it was parents, particularly your boomer parents. The older I get, the more I realize just how diet culture has impacted both of my parents, you know, and their attitudes about food and diet and how they pass some of those along to me. What's it been like engaging this sort of, you know, being on this journey that you're on and dealing with your own parents? Yeah, it's been interesting. Um I am really fortunate, well, and just privileged that, you know, I was a thin kid. I became a fat adult, but I was a thin kid. So weight wasn't weaponized against me growing up the way a lot of kids in bigger bodies experience. But I was aware of weight as this thing that my parents were anxious about. My dad in particular was pretty calorie conscious. This was the 80s, low fat, skim milk, Diet Coke, all of that, you know, was a big part of our lives. And I was aware that I was given this free pass around treats that adults in my life were not giving themselves. And so that was sort of disconcerting. And I think there were definitely moments, and I see this come up over and over. I mean, almost any time I interview someone about their relationship with food and their body, stuff with their parents and especially their mom comes up, right? Because the comments parents make, these are the things that live rent-free in a kid's head forever. So there is that, Right. And at the same time, it's so important not to shame and blame individual people for this because we are all swimming in this. We are all, you know, given all of this messaging. And for boomers, you know, they came of age at the start of modern diet culture. You know, the 60s and 70s was a rough time for fat politics because, you know, you had the civil rights movement, you had second wave feminism. But at the same time, it was almost like we're making progress on these issues. So the thin ideal was getting more and more rigid. And I think it's very much in response to that. Women are entering the workplace in greater numbers. Okay, but only if you can do it in this body that men find safe and comfortable. So all of that's coming into play. And then boomers just have like decade after decade of diet culture. They had the fat-free stuff in the 80s. They had the carb anxiety in the 90s and the aughts. They had the sugar stuff added on. And it's like 
as it changes, they never drop out the old version. It just kind of keeps layering on. So it is not surprising that this is a generation that's got some stuff around food and bodies. And I think trying to find some compassion for that, for the fact that they have not been given permission to feel safe in their bodies pretty much ever. And as they are getting older and we have to layer in the experiences of ageism that they're they're dealing with, that's a whole other hurdle to this. So I'm not saying anyone has to just like immediately forgive their parent for putting them on a diet. Like this is harm and you're allowed to name that harm happened. But I do think it's more productive to try to understand those experiences. And then, of course, when you need to set some boundaries, you know, like we're really trying not to talk about diets in front of the kids. So we would love, you know, if we can make Thanksgiving a diet talk free space and, you know, or we, we're really not comfortable with fat jokes. They don't seem funny to us. And we don't want the kids picking up on that, like setting those boundaries And if they don't work, talking to your kid afterwards and saying, you know, it makes me really sad that grandma doesn't let herself eat bread. And I'm just really glad that you don't have to live that way. So your kid can understand that what their grandparent is struggling with, it's not being modeled for them in that way. Well, Virginia, thank you so much for being here. Your book, Fat Talk, is out now. Where else can people find you? You can find me at the Burnt Toast newsletter, which is virginiasoulsmith.substack.com. And there's also the Burnt Toast podcast, which you can get wherever you are listening to this podcast. And I am on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at V underscore Soulsmith. That's our show this week. This episode is produced by Shana Roth and Rosemary Belson. Daisy Rosario is our senior supervising producer. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio. We'd love to hear from you. Email us at thewaves at slate.com. The Waves will be back next week. Different hosts, different topic, same time and place.